So after being in the New Testament for a few weeks, we're going to turn now to the Old Testament, uh, get past the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and then you've got Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and that's where we are today. We are in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Emelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Milan and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Emelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Milan and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that Yahweh had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where they had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May Yahweh show kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and me. May Yahweh grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and they said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why will you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because Yahweh's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May Yahweh deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Do not call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but Yahweh has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? Yahweh has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the blessing of this day and for the word that we have before us. I pray that your message that uh, you are bringing through me would be one that we would be receiving into our hearts and drawing us closer through this to you in a relationship through your son Jesus, and that the spirit that you place within us when we come to you through your son Jesus would be ignited with a passion to not only know you better, but to reflect that relationship to the, all the world around us. Lord, help us to be your children in more than just name, but in everything that we do, and that would be evident to the whole world, Lord, that we would be seen as your children, undeniably and faithfully. Through your son's name we pray. Amen. So when we start this chapter, we see that Naomi's family, they were called Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. And in Genesis 35, Rachel, Jacob's wife, died giving birth to their son, Benjamin. And they happened to be on the way to Ephrath. A very old tradition is that Ephrath is Bethlehem. The prophet Micah also referred to Bethlehem as Bethlehem Ephrath. Now, where this originated or what meaning it may have held is unclear, uh, 
Uh, what we do know is that it is apparently the original name or an old name for Bethlehem. And at times there were periods where the old name had not gone away. And so you'd hear it in uh, conjunction with the name Bethlehem. Now, it doesn't really play much of a, of, a, of a role in what we're talking about. It's just that whenever I see a name or a word that I do not immediately recognize, I like to do a little bit of research on it to understand a little bit more, to have a little bit of background, um, simply so that I'm not left completely in the dark with it. So they are, again, they're leaving Bethlehem. They left Bethlehem because of a famine that was in the land. And we get the impression that in total, Naomi was in Moab for about 10 years. And in that time, a lot happened. She lost her husband. She gained two daughters-in-law. But then she lost both of her sons. These sons of hers married Moabite women, essentially foreigners. Now, God had made restrictions against marrying foreigners, but this did not appear to apply to Moabites. There were certainly restrictions against Moabites uh, being in the presence of the Lord in the uh, tabernacle and the, the place of meeting, but there were no restrictions of, of Israelites marrying Moabites. These were, after all, Lot's descendants along with the Ammonites. And so they married these Moabite women. And given the order of mention, it can be assumed that Milan was the eldest son and married first, as, is, as would have been tradition. So it's hard to say exactly how long either of them would have been married, but it would be safe to say that Kilion and Ruth had not been married long when he died. After all, they'd only been in the land 10 years, and he would have had to have waited for his brother to be married, and, and so on and so forth. So now Naomi is left without her husband, without her sons, and she has two daughters-in-law who are also without husbands. And during this period of time, there were few good opportunities for women to provide for themselves, to earn a living. Uh, basically, they had one of three choices. Either sell themselves into slavery, become prostitutes, or simply die, starve and die. And this was true in, in all societies at the time, not just Moab and Judah. There just wasn't a, a whole plethora of opportunities for, for women and, and what they could do. Good or bad, right or wrong. That's just the way it was at the time. And presumably, Naomi at this point was beyond childbearing age and has no real prospects for remarrying. So what is she going to do? She can't provide for herself, but then she hears that the famine had ended in Judah and that the Lord was providing for them there. So she's making a choice. She's going to return to Judah. She's going to return to her homeland. But she wanted her daughters-in-law to stay, and she says to return to their mother's house. Now, there's significance with that, because typically, as, as it seems that the fathers would be the ones that would be their father's house, they're the ones that are providing, uh, just, again, the way, the way it was set up. But she says mother's house rather than father's house, because she's emphasizing her desire for them to remarry. It was the mother who played a huge role in the whole process of the daughters being married to begin with. And so she's trying to emphasize that desire, and it's a point that she then clarifies again in verse 9. Now initially, neither one of them wants to leave Naomi's side. But ultimately, Orpah listens to her, and she returns to her mother and father. Naomi knows, again, she, she knows she cannot provide financially for herself or for, for these women. She cannot provide them new husbands. And she wants what's best for them, even if it means that she will never see them again. But Ruth would not listen. Instead, she, she pleads to Naomi. She says, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Now, this statement that she makes may not mean a whole lot to us today, but it was an incredible testimony of Ruth's loyalty to Naomi and to her budding relationship with the one true God. This is a powerful, impactful statement that she makes that is oftentimes lost on us because we don't understand the commitment that she's making. Now, Naomi had told the girls to return to their families and to their gods, but Ruth was willing to leave all that behind. 
She's leaving family. She's leaving the land that she was familiar with. She's leaving the gods that she grew up worshiping. She's leaving everything. For what? No future, no promise, no hope. But yet she was fully committed to following Naomi to Judah. Not just leaving her family and everything she knew, but also she's willing to be buried away from her ancestors in a foreign land. This is a pretty big deal. The Bible and many of the pagan nations refer to death as being gathered to one's peoples. We, we read in the scriptures in the Old Testament how uh, if any of these folks died away from their homelands, they requested that their remains be brought back home whenever they returned. Joseph, Israel, they all asked for their remains to be returned. There were examples of, of, of wives dying and the husbands traveling with their remains to, to bury them in their, with their family, among their, among their ancestors. And it's likely that if she had not already done so, that Naomi was actually traveling now with the remains of her husband and her sons back to Judah. If she had not already returned their remains, she was doing so as she went along right here. It was that important. So it's one thing to leave your family and to leave everything you know, but then to never be buried again with them, never to be regathered to them, something that was so vitally important to most of these nations, most of these cultures, these people, was huge. It shows her commitment. This, these statements that she's making, it changes her life. It would ultimately affect all men. Because through Ruth, a Moabite woman, a foreigner and widow, King David will be born. And in time, through his line, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the great Redeemer of us all. But she did not know what was to come. She didn't know any of that. She could not have known the importance of her faith and her decisions. So why? Why give up everything? Sure, she's lost her husband, but she must have still had family and friends in the area. Was it loyalty to Naomi? A mother-in-law that she knew for a few years at best? Faithfulness to a God that she did not know before meeting them? Well, perhaps both. Ruth's life stands in contrast to the book that it, that, it, that it follows, the book of Judges. The book of Judges details the faithlessness of Israel and of its leaders. Whereas Ruth displays faithfulness despite not being an Israelite, despite being a Moabite. And she was no leader. She was powerless. She was a widow and a foreigner. But throughout her life, Ruth stood by her mother's side, mother-in-law's side. She was caring for her and loving her. Her faith throughout all of this, all of her actions, is, is, is evident. The faith throughout all the actions is so evident. And she consistently, if you continue reading the rest of the book of Ruth, you'll see that she consistently is acting with integrity and dignity, honor and loyalty. Through every step of the way, Ruth places her trust and her faith in God as she's clinging to Naomi. You get the sense, especially as you continue through the book, that Naomi, Naomi was, had a pretty good head on her shoulders. Excuse me, Ruth had a pretty good head on her shoulders. She knew what she, what she was doing. She, she wasn't a foolish person. She wasn't dumb. So she had to have known as she's clinging to Naomi and, and leaving everything behind, she had to realize that Naomi could not provide for them both. She had to understand that her choice meant that either that her trust was, was vital because she, either God would provide or they'll both die. See, Ruth's life is a tale of redemption. Now, several times, as a matter of fact, in this chapter, we see a key word here. We see the word return. 
And the Hebrew forms of this word found here are appropriate illustrations of repentance, of reversing direction, of turning away. Because in making this decision and clinging to Naomi and, and, and vowing Naomi's God as her God, Ruth is turning away from the sinful worship of false gods, of the lustful pagan practices, and, and what ultimately she discovered was a godless life. She chose to turn away from her old life and trust God, the Almighty, for a new life. Does this sound familiar? Ruth did not grow up knowing God through his word, though. Rather, she met him through her husband's family. She came to know God by how they lived and by the love they shared. Ruth is a great example of faith, not in how much we know, but in how much we love. And she came to love the God of Israel to the point that she was willing to give up everything. She would give up everything, even her very life. All for God. And Ruth gives hope to and for all who have not yet come to a relationship with God. Because anyone, anyone can come to God with humble repentance and be welcomed. It does not matter what worldly labels we wear, what we look like, where we come from. Even the sins of our past can be forgiven. Scripture tells us there's only one sin that cannot be forgiven, and that's to blaspheme or to deny God. And the reason that it cannot be forgiven is because the one who would do such a thing has no heart for God, and thus they would not be repentant. They would not ask for forgiveness. And that's a crucial part of it. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Ruth was willing to deny herself for God. She humbled herself, and God exalted her. She's a magnificent, magnificent example for us all, because faith, a relationship with God, does not require a special pedigree. It doesn't matter where we came from. It doesn't require perfection. We don't wait till we're sinless to come to him. We don't wait till we got our life worked out before we come to him. Faith only requires a willingness to love as he loves us. Ruth was a wonderful example of this. I hope that we're able to join one another again next week as we continue looking into this book a little bit more and looking into the relationship between Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, and Naomi's relationship with God. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we thank you humbly that you would continue to preserve your word for us, that we would be able to know you and to grow closer to you through a wonderful, beautiful relationship that you've opened up for us through your son, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your mercy and your grace that pours out upon us sinful people. Lord, I thank you for the hope of life that you offer thank you for your patience that you would be willing to wait for us to get over our insecurities, our anxieties our pain, our troubles to someday one day before we die to come to you to know you to ask for forgiveness